Hello and welcome to another episode, our 11th episode of the Little Knowledge Podcast with me, Paul Busby, and as always, Goff Morgan. Hello, Goff. Hello. Greetings to you. How are you all doing? How are you, Mr. B? I'm not bad, actually. I'm okay. How are things in Malchus? Fine and dandy. That's the best way to describe it. It's cosy in here today. Mm. Cosy? No, oh, well, that's a cosy, positive snug. sign. Yeah. Don't want to go out today. It looks grey and horrible and wet. Good. Well, people don't need to go out. They can stay in and listen to us. Yeah. That's stay, right. in us. stay in, listen to us. And keep, imagine we we're, were preventative. We we're preventative medicine. Stay in. <laughs> we're good for you. We can't, can't give you anything. You're all right. Well, is, is that a little preview of medicines to come later? Uh, oh, maybe, maybe. That's not, it's, it's a, let's say, a foretelling, as they say in short story circumstances. Okay. Well, by the way, uh, do subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the video, it helps other people find it, apparently. I, I don't know the, the algorithms and the science behind mm. that, but I'm told that. And all your comments are very welcome. And even if you've got any ideas for future properties and future bits you might want us to talk about, just uh, drop us a line or put it in the comment box below, and that would be great. Now, today, yeah, Bob, we are talking about Pontypool Park. Does that mean much to you going in? Indeed. I worked um, in a building very close to Pontypool Park very and uh, spent many happier, many times, uh, lunch times in the swimming pool area there. Uh, obviously, the rugby ground is there. So I've got a rugby match in Pontypool Park. Is it? Yeah, Pontypool Park, Hanbury Park is also built marvellous. It's an old stomping ground then in many ways. Yeah, yeah, familiar. Yeah, familiar with it. Well, oh, and of course, the... Um, uh, a museum there, Torvine Museum, is in the stable block of what was Hanbury. It is, which we'll have a little look how they've renovated that at the end as well. Yeah. Um, now, I said Pontypool Park, Pontypool Park, so let's start in Killeen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our story today begins in Killeen, uh, and it begins in the 1670s, it must have been, with a chap called Charles Williams. Now, Charles Williams was about 37, 38 at the time, and he got involved with a young lady. And it appears that his cousin took umbrage at this, whether they were after the same young lady, I have no idea. Mm. But it ended in a duel, where, as the oh. legend says, Charles Williams killed his cousin and had to flee the country. And he fled, so the legend says, all yeah. the way to Smyrna, where he was involved as a fig merchant or possibly a silk merchant, um, trading with Turkey, trading with Russia. And there he was. Oh, made an enormous fortune by all accounts. And then he came back thanks to his friend, John Hanbury of Pontypool, who sort of made sure things were safe for him to come back with the authorities. And whether he got a pardon from Queen Anne or from uh, William and Mary, we're not sure, but that's what the legend says. And he came back, uh, not to Killeen, but he came back to London, where he made so much money, he lent money to the government. So- <laughs> Very wealthy Hello. man indeed. Yeah. Um, in fact, he lived in the street. Uh, his neighbour was Grinlin Gibbons in London. Oh, this. Grinlin oh, Gibbons. They have the same house. Grinlin Gibbons is mentioned in Charles Williams's will. Um, he was a witness to his will. Uh, Grinlin Gibbons's house fell down in a storm in 1701. So. Uh, oh. It's a shame. Oh, God. And it is, apparently, because um, Grinling Gibbons, you know, was the famous woodcarver. Mm. Um, and his own home was incredibly lavishly um, decorated. We'd done them mm. above one of the one of the doorways, one of the rooms, there was um, a carved um, uh, vase of flowers, which was so realistic that it, uh, as, a, as a cart went past outside, the flowers would, would quiver in the vase mm -hmm. as if they were real, the real flowers. Yeah, mm -hmm. astonishingly, astonishingly fine wood carp. Yeah, well, it, it, his house fell down. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. On the, on the walls were good. The walls themselves, not so good. <laughs> yeah, and on the corner of Bow Street, which is, he lived in Bow Street with, uh, with Gibbons and Russell Street, there was Tom's Coffee House, where Charles Williams used to go. Now he was very rich, exceedingly wealthy. But what do you do is you could get your post for free 
in Tom's coffee house, if you knew the local worthies who would come along, who could have free posts, such as the MPs, yes. so Colonel Vaughan and John Morgan of Tredegar, the Lord Lieutenant of Monmouthshire, would frank his post. So it's like snobbery, really. I could afford oh, it, but the Lord Lieutenant of Monmouthshire is franking my post. <laughs> so he made a lot of money, Charles Williams, but he yeah. never married. Maybe it was his one true love in Killeen, which he never went back mm. to. Uh, so he gave uh, John Hanbury in his will seven £70,000 in 1720. Oh, for uh, heaven's sake. On the proviso... Astronomical sum of Enormous. Money. On the proviso <coughs> that John Hanbury's son, his, <coughs> Charles Williams' godson, Charles, uh, took at some point the surname Williams and added it to his own. So his godson mm. became Charles Hanbury Williams, and that enormous amount of money entered the Hanbury family. He, he mm. didn't uh, forget Killian. He set up what became known as the Killian Charity, which lived on. And you know of uh, the Killian Charity? Of the Killian Charity. And for education, he set up the Endowed School, which is uh, still there, of course. There it is. It's near the Legionary Museum, oh, sort of opposite it. it. In 1724, the Charles Williams School, Endowed School, was set up. So he's left his mark on yeah. Killian to this day. Now, the thing about Charles Williams, though, um, that's the local legend, right? That's the legend that people know uh, about this duel. Now, about 40 years ago, somebody set up, uh, did a very good interest in journal article that said, now, are we sure about all this? Because there is no record of a royal pardon anywhere. And mm. in the 1690s, he's in London, not in Smyrna. Uh, what, and, but there oh. is a different Williams who was a Turkish trader from Smyrna. So did they mix them up? And that's fantastic research. Um, but then they said they lost me, I have to say, when they said, mm. well, all that's false. I'm pretty. Maybe the duel is false as well. Would a 37 year old man fight for love? Surely that's something um, a young man would do. And that it was at that point that they lost no, that, me. Yeah, no, that that doesn't work. And also, I mean, people would duel on the most spurious of bloody reason, as we discovered in a previous episode. So, no, I mean, maybe that doesn't hold together at all in the history of dueling. Does it? <laughs> no. So we do know that the, he did do it with the school. He did give £70,000 to John Hanbury. Um, at, and I think and the, the Hanburys of Pontypool always said there was a duel. He never returned to Killian, so there must have been a reason. Mm, yeah, quite. So I think maybe Hanbury ironed it out with aggrieved parties, maybe rather than an official pardon from the government. But if he if he was never charged, there wouldn't have been the need well, for it, an official it, pardon. No, exactly. So I'm pro duel. I have to say, I think it probably did happen. Well, yeah, there's some reason to say it didn't. And again, and, and you know, the reason they say it didn't that doesn't really hold water in in, in in light of what we know about the reasons for dueling. So. Great journal article. But I mean. If he didn't, um, if he didn't make his money from the trading in Smyrna and all that sort of business, then what? Um, where did he? Uh, did he make the money then? Well, when he came home, he, we know he made a lot with sort of on the London sort of shares and things like that. Oh, 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 I see stocks and shares. Okay. Oh, I stop. I uh, uh, stop. Okay, but there are yeah. twenty-five years of his life which are unaccounted for. So there is. This, oh, he gosh. may even have gone to Smyrna. See who knows. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, the school is there, and good old John Hanbury. Could rejoice at seventy thousand pounds. He rubs his hands together with glee. This that's incredible amount. I mean, that's got to be that's like, oh, four, enormous. Yeah, four, fourteen million, it's virtually. Quite... I guess an estimation for wow. fourteen to twenty-one million pounds. <gasps> he was a good friend, was Charles Williams. Uh, the, the Hanburys, by the way, were from Worcestershire originally. And they were in the ironworks game very early, as early as the 1570s. Oh, the Hanbury family were involved. But their links with Pontypool were slightly later. It was in 1655 when John Hanbury's father acquired a parcel of waste ground from the Morgans ah. uh, in Pontypool. And it had a forge on it. And John Hanbury turned that forge into an ironworks which succeeded magnificently. And it's, it wasn't just his money. He had a zeal for trying new things, you see. And what he introduced was a water wheel powered rolling mill to manufacture thin iron sheets. Before that, you had to hammer them with a large hammer. But he produced oh, the rolling yeah. mill. 
So what that means is it, it leads on to tin. So canned mm. goods and tinned goods. Uh, it all really comes from the progenitor of all of this, which is John Hambry of Pontypool. Good heavens. Well, 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 well. So the British tin plate industry, you yeah. could say, starts with this man. I mean, what is tin plate? I mean, it's only iron sheets covered with tin, essentially, originally. Yeah. So it all starts with him. So to keep an eye on this Pontypool Ironworks, which is starting to flourish, he basically sets up the Hanbury residence in Pontypool. So they build Pontypool Park House, and there it is. Ah, there we go. Oh, gosh. So he's not doing badly for himself at all, is he? No. And his first wife brought lots of connections uh, in, the, in the industry, but his second wife, Bridget Ascoff, did very well. She was a friend and an intimate of Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough. Oh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I thought I knew the name Ascoff. I don't know why I've come across it. You may well. But it's in connection with Sarah Churchill, perhaps. It might have been. Sarah was last seen on the big screen, played by Rachel Weiss in the movie The Favourite of a couple of years ah. ago. Um, Sarah Churchill, yeah. Now, it's said that uh, these gates, which are still there, ironwork, yes. uh, were given by Sarah, uh, Duchess of Marlborough, to Bridget uh, when they got married. Uh, they're known as oh, the right. Sally Gates. Sally, Sarah. It's close yeah. enough, isn't it? So yeah, these yeah. are the original gates. The side gates were made in the 19th century in Blenavon. And right. they used to separate the house from the stable block, but they were moved in the 19th century. Right. There they are, the Sally gates. Oh, and by the way, they, used to, they used to be familiar colour scheme for you, Goff, who knows uh, Tredega, uh, black, uh, and they were tinged with gold leaf. Yes, I remember seeing that when I was around Pontypool area working at the time. And I was surprised to see them this um, this colour. <laughs> this, this is the authentic colour when oh, they were first right. given by the Duchess of Marlborough. Oh, right, good Lord. So, you know, yeah, Cadu yeah, looked at it and... Uh, yeah, the, the, it was a very... Yeah, the, the colour combinations of that period were uh, very strange to a uh, sort of way of thinking about it today. It looks an odd yeah. colour, isn't it? It's like an undercoat rather than an actual... Yes, uh, a top coat. It's very strange. Oh, it really does. But but yeah, but it's uh, but that's if you're in the same circles as you know the great Duke of Marlborough, and they weren't just in the circles of the Duke of Marlborough. The Duke made John Hanbury one of his executors to his will. Really? So cool. they were certainly in. The, and just to keep you perky with things like this, there was a suspicion in 1720 that Sarah, the Duchess of Marlborough, was in the middle of a Jacobite plot. Oh, good Lord, yeah. <laughs> John Hanbury was also close friends with Lord Strafford, who was right into the old pretender. So even in Pontypool, you get the feeling that if the Jacobites <laughs> yeah. had risen up, even the Protestant Hanburys may well have joined them. There's no, no firm evidence, but, you know, the circle that they're in, yeah. there is that little bit of Jacobitism going yeah. around. They also gave, uh, and becoming a, an executor of the Duke of Marlborough, they also, Sarah also gave them a service of fine plate and his wife, Bridget, was given a set of jewels. So didn't they do well out of the Marlboroughs? Yeah. Of, of Blenheim fame, of course. You don't get yeah. much greater than the Marlboroughs. Um, so everything is, is booming. I mean, even the stuff that they're not owning or running themselves, they're influencing, such as Pontypool Japanware. Oh, of course. Which was encouraged by, uh, by the Hanburys. He also yeah. was the MP for Monmouthshire in the 1730s when uh, Sir William Morgan of Tredegar died young and his children were all young. There was a political vacuum in Monmouthshire and the Hanburys just went straight in there. And John Hanbury was MP for Monmouthshire. Spent a bit as well. He spent £22,725 purchasing various manors, including Cold Brook Park, just south of Abergavenny, Oh, yeah, it is our Alami stock photo for Coldbrook Park. Hooray! Good, good old Alami stock photo. We haven't had one of those for a while. <laughs> yeah, we always need it, don't we, really? Yeah, you need, you need at least one every episode, as far as I can <laughs> And this is where Charles Williams of Killian comes in again. Remember I said that you could only get that huge amount of cash if his godson changed his name to Williams? Yes. John Hanbury's son. Uh, this is what happens. Charles Hanbury Williams, as he became, inherited Coldbrook Park. So the son, yeah. Hanbury Williams, uh, lived there. Let's have a look at Hanbury Williams. There he is. Ah. So Charles he was made, Hanbury Williams. 
a knight of the bath in 1744. There he is. And he is a remarkable character. He is quite extraordinary. He was a poet, a satirist, a diplomat, and his poems were uh, witty but licentious. <laughs> he, was, he, he became MP for Monmouthshire as well, as well as MP for Lempster for a while. Uh, he knew Henry Fox. He knew Henry Fielding. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. And Henry Fielding used to say that uh, Charles Hanbury Williams was good for a guinea and would always, also yeah. always pass his plays through him. Oh, Charlie, could you have a little look at that? Unfortunately, oh, right. unfortunately Charles Hanbury Williams was not uh, particularly reliable and it was known for him to lose plays that Fielding oh. had given to him. <laughs> In fact, he lost one called The Father or The Good-Natured Man that was only yeah. discovered years later by the actor Garrick. Because Charles oh, just lost it. Good grief. So in the day he protect he, when he was in South Wales, it was good for him. He said, when it was in London, his base of vices were revealed. <laughs> I mean, and in white <laughs> and clubs like that, people were scared of him because he was close to Walpole, the Prime Minister, but he was merciless with his satire and his poetry yeah. to any enemies. Just little things. Um, oh. About the Earl of about uh, Lord Bath, he wrote, Leave a blank here and there in each page to enroll the fair deeds of his youth. When you mention the acts of his age, leave a blank for his honor and truth. <laughs> but they were, but he could get very licentious. In fact, um, Dr. Johnson said of him, Our lively and elegant, though too licentious, lyric bard, he has no fame but from boys who drank with him. Oh, God, not. <laughs> it got pretty bad, in fact, so, but his poetry was meant to be read out in pubs. It was never meant to be published, a lot of it. No. Yeah. And when it was published, it sort of looked a bit harsh on paper, shall yeah. we say. It was said that he retired to Monmouthshire to avoid a succession of duels when one of his poems was inadvertently published. A grief. <laughs> How many people did he manage to slag off in one poem? Then? Oh, quite a, a few. Succession of jewels, and they were <laughs> and they were always very important people. Oh, <laughs> oh good for him. <laughs> However, it is good to go back to Colebrook Park because uh, he writes here, uh, and this does sum him up the way his life was and his relationship with Colebrook Park and Monmouthshire. Easy wherever I am, for I can stay six months in Wales, yet know no tedious day. There regularly study, eat and sleep, and sober meals and early hours I keep. But when the invested year wears winter's frown, my coach is ordered and I drive to town. There dash into a stream of new delight, enjoy my friends by day, my nymph by night. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, his doctor once said of Sir Charles Hanbury Williams, his case of syphilis was the worst I have ever <laughs> seen. And then, unfortunately... <laughs> An historical detail you really wish you didn't know, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I will, I will never be able to now put that out of my mind. <laughs> the problem was... He didn't tell his wife, Frances, who was the daughter of the Earl of Coningsby, and he no. promptly infected Frances, well, at which point decided she didn't want to see him ever again. And you can't That'd blame her, really. Under the circumstances, yeah. They had two daughters, which he was a very good uh, father, but his wife, understandably, didn't want anything more to do with him. But that was all right, because his, his career as a diplomat meant he had to head off abroad. Some people said... It's a good job he went abroad because of all the people desperate to kill him in this country. Yeah. So he went off um, with his tertiary syphilis. Off he went, packed to uh, become, uh, to go to Dresden as a diplomat. Did very well in Dresden. Met, and then went to Berlin and met Voltaire. Did very oh, well God. there. And then he was given the job in 1755 as our man in St. Petersburg, the British ambassador to uh, Russia big job. And it was there that he met a man he had as his secretary um, called Stanislaw, let me see, Stanislaw Poniatowski, Stanislaw Poniatowski, and he headed off and he introduced him in Russia to his close friend, the Grand Duchess. 
and they had a little romance going. So he was a bit of a matchmaker. Oh. He was Charles was very close to this Grand Duchess, not as close as Stannis Law, obviously. Well, quite. But the Grand <clears throat> Duchess, a few years later, became Catherine the Great. Oh, blimey! And oh, his secretary, well. Stannis Law, became King of Poland. What? <laughs> what? What? Oh gosh! All this from a chap who lived at Coldbrook Park, Abergavenny. Yeah, it's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Extraordinary life. I mean, he really did have an extraordinary life, and he was a very good diplomat. Uh, but it, his uh, illness, shall we say, did affect his mental health. Right, there he right. is, looking startled. Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, yeah. He lost his uh, he lost his wits, it was said, and lost his mind, which may well have been the tertiary syphilis, yeah, which hit him in waves. Um, and he came back, and he said, uh, he came back home, uh, not in his right mind, and he said, Cold Brook will be my coffin." So I'll go back to Coldbrook to die. Now, after a few weeks in Coldbrook, he got his senses back and had grand plans for the garden. He was going to do yeah. this and that and let us survive perfectly sane, perfectly. Mm. Uh, in, but then it was hit again and they took him to London and they confined him. And he died possibly of his own hand at the age of 50 oh, in 1759. Go. But oh, he lives yeah. on because he was such a character. Some of his papers are in Newport Library. Others are in oh. Connecticut. His poetry is all over the world. Um, but George Bernard Shaw wrote a play uh, uh, called Great Catherine. And his character, uh, Charles Eddiston, clearly based mm. on Charles Hanbury Williams, uh, he's in that, which means he's in the movie version, uh, Great Catherine, 1968, where our dear Sir Charles is played by Peter O'Toole. Oh, good <laughs> <laughs> who do you think could drink who under the table? <laughs> Quite yet. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well, well. But an interesting character. Now, yeah, what, happened to, life. what happened to Coldbrook? Well, this is Coldbrook. Uh, the Her it was an old Herbert home, it was. Um, oh, so, so Charles put this Georgian bit on, but there are much older bits that go back a very long way. Yeah. Um, and if I can just... Uh, change a little bit of a share here because they went in it in the 1950s a bit like they did with Lanwern for those who saw our Lanwern video Lanwern oh, house yeah. so there we are it looked okay in the 50s but it's a fascinating yeah. house because of the history you know it's not just one time period yes I mean this is much older this bit isn't it oh, yeah. I mean it's a fascinating building that is incredibly yeah. yeah incredible building uh, I'm very fond of Colebrook Park. I think it's, uh, imagine all the history connected to Sir Charles Hanbury Williams and all the people he knew mm. and all the people he enraged. Very mm. pretty house. Mm. Yeah, very pretty house. But of course, it's the 1950s and that's how it looked in the 1950s. So uh, yeah, what yeah. is it? What is it that we do to it? We destroy it. Oh, gosh. Oh, dear me. It's <laughs> horrifying, isn't it? Oh. I'm afraid it is. And, and this for me is a greater loss than Flanwern House because yeah. all the history of the Herberts there, all the wonderful history of, of this incredible man, Sir Charles Hanbury mm. Williams, could be told magnificently there today, couldn't it? Mm. But, you know, as you say, Goff, you can't save all of them, but I wish no. they'd have tried with Coldbrook. Yeah. Such a terrible loss. Anyway, forget Coldbrook okay. and Sir Charles, as diverting as he is. Let's get back to Pontypool. So Charles didn't get on with his brother at Pontypool Park, who was a bit more staid. Uh, um, no, yes, yes. I mean, everyone was staid compared to Charles Hanbury Williams, I think, but there you go. His name was Capel Hanbury. Capel is a name that comes up a lot. It was the name of an ancestral yes. family. Lots of Capels. And his brother, Capel Hanbury, was uh, at Pontypool Park. And uh, Sir Charles says of him, he was a slave not only to passion, but ill humour. He said, it always makes me feel a little uneasy that Cold Brook is so close to Pontypool Park. Oh, he said, his, my brother has boasted that he has bought the whole of Caldicott Castle. He said, well, do, do you, did I expect him to buy just the keep? Maybe a little <laughs> corner, maybe a little patch. <laughs> so he wasn't that fond of Capel Hanbury. Yeah. Um, and maybe it has to be said without being unkind, Maybe at the people of Pontypool weren't either. Whereas John Hanbury was known as the father of Pontypool, Capel Hanbury, and we're talking 
George III's early reign, so late seven, right. early 1760s, yes. and because many uh, centuries later, in 1916, they found a secret cupboard at Pontypool Park House. Oh. They opened the secret cupboard and they discovered a store of arms consisting of 50 flint lock muskets with bayonets attached, a hundred spare bayonets, five swords, and they were dated 1761 to 64, so capal time. It was just in case there was a riot. He had his own secret armory. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, Hidden yeah. in Pontypool Put Park. Put down the uprising. Good heavens. Put down the uprising, yeah. Yeah, good lord. Well, yeah, but he, but he, yeah, he can't think. He must have realised he was not. Uh, if you think he's that unpopular. <laughs> Yeah. So he's in fear of a, you know, an uprising. That's, that's quite astonishing. This image here, though, is a little bit later than Capel's. Uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, um, I think the 1830s, when another uh, Hanbury had taken over called Capel Hanbury Lee. Ah. Capel Hanbury Lee, a name yeah. I know me that means something to you, Goff. Yeah. Now, what you're seeing here is Pontypool spread out here. This is the Church of St. James. This is the town hall that the Hanburys gave to Pontypool. Oh, yeah. oh, right, you can yeah. see the town beginning to spread around yeah. here. Now, Capel Hanbury Lee was the man who gave the town hall to Pontypool. Um, in, his, in his younger days, it was slightly annoying to him because his, uh, when his elder brother died, his mother, the mother stayed living in Pontypool Park, you see, and remarried. Hmm. And she loved... Capel. She loved her children. However, the stepfather was a wonderfully wicked stepfather. Oh. He came from County Kerry. His name was Thomas Stoughton. And Thomas Stoughton, living in Pontypool Park, while the Hanburys at this point were just about still running the ironworks. And what Thomas used yeah. to do was turn off the water to stop oh. <laughs> to stop the rolling mills in the ironworks. <laughs> and Capel got fed up with this and he used to go off. So it, it, the water supplied the forge, you know. Yeah. He used to go up to the form, his foreman, James Powell, and say, James, take this iron bar and hit Mr. Stoughton down. <laughs> James Good. never did. I've got the image yeah. that every day, you know, Capel <laughs> was going, yeah. James, take these pliers and attack his nostrils. James, here's a knife, stab him through the gizzard. James, here's a... And luckily, James Powell, the foreman at Pontypool, was a wiser man and didn't do any of this. But Stoughton was so bad that when the brother died, he wouldn't allow the body to be brought into Pontypool Park House. Because he believed that if the body of the Hanbury entered Pontypool Park House, it would give the body, and therefore those related to it, new legal rights. I'm not sure how he worked that one out. Uh, uh, no, I look, no, I'm not quite sure how you worked that one out at all. No, I quite, what, uh, Stoughton wasn't going to take the risk, obviously. No, quite, no. So he stopped the cortege coming in. Oh, when Capel eventually took over the house, he, um, Stoughton and Capel's mum lived nearby where that church now is, no. near there. And it was known as the House of Spite. <laughs> <laughs> I would love if there's a build because I know it's all built up with the town centre here. I would love yes, if there is a build. I think it's mostly Torvine County Council. Yeah, I wouldn't say yeah. they would rename their their offices the House of Spite. House but of I'd spite, quite like yeah. I'd quite like a pub to call itself the House of Spite. Yeah, yes. Yeah, have the Stoughton Arms there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, speaking of pubs, of course, we talked about Killian. There is a Hanbury Arms in Killian. Yes, that's so right. Yes, I, for some reason I never connected the two family, the, the the name. Isn't that bizarre? You know the Hanbury Arms in Cleve for years, and I never put the name together with the Hanbury family in Pontypool. Isn't that peculiar? Well, you get all these connections. Yeah. I mean, Capel married uh, Molly Mackworth. Now, Molly Mackworth was the widow of the Mackworths from the priory at Killian. If you remember, Lady oh, Rhonda yes. married a, a Mackworth baronet in one of our that's other right, episodes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Now, Molly Mackworth, she did love gardening and landscape design because this is after molly mackworth had a go at the land she appears to have flattened a fair bit of it uh, I tried, yes. so she did quite a few things molly mackworth um for instance she quite enjoyed the grotto which is in pontypool park yes, the grotto yes. is 700 feet above sea level so to get there you do have to go up a bit of a hill mm. uh, the grotto uh, and it's 
colored glass you see here. Now, in all honesty, this probably started life under old John Hanbury as a summer house oh, you know, way back in the 1700s. Yeah. That's probably where it started. But Molly certainly altered it. Now, there are two legends about this, that Molly met a hermit in France and said, you can live on the Pontypool Park estate as long as you help us build it or rebuild it, I think, in the 1830s and add shells to it. Molly Mackworth loved yeah, collecting shell shells. All right. Um, now, it's either that or they put out an advert for a hermit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guardian media hermit. page. Wanted. Hermit. <laughs> a sort of ornamental hermit. Who yeah, sort I mean, it's a there. bizarre idea, isn't it? That the, 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 uh, the idea that you, did, you, you uh, got somebody to dress rather raggedly and live in your grotto. <laughs> just so you can see you floating around the estate. You know, official hermit. It's a bizarre setup. <laughs> but okay, but when money is no object, you can do anything you like, can't you? Really, so you want to part, and probably wants to do it. It's easy living, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it was. I mean, later years uh, after it was uh, Edward the Seventh, it was said picnicked there. So your favourite king, Edward the Seventh, Bertie, picnicked Bertie, there. Come on. Uh, it's, it's amazing now. I mean, it's it's pennant sandstone, and some of the things inside are real stalactites taken from caves in the area. So it's one oh, of Molly, it's a great creation by Molly Mackworth. Yes. So if we look inside, I mean, wow. Oh, yeah, I've seen some pictures of the interior. I haven't actually been there, but I've seen the pictures. They're fantastic. Do you notice this colour, Golf? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Again, they stripped back the colour on there, and they found that this, the same as the Sally Gates, was the original oh, colour. They did God. love that sort of drab colour, didn't they, back in the early Stage 18th time. century? They've done a very good... Um, good uh, a job on that, like, haven't they? To actually recreate these colours. Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, wonderful. It was restored in 1996. Yeah. Uh, the grotto. Uh, but I just love the idea of a hermit knocking about in there. Really, you know, if yes. anyone goes past, yeah. if there's a house party at Pontypool Park House, Capel's there. He just sort of waves from a yes. top. <laughs> yeah. Who's that? Oh, it's just the hermit, our ornamental like hermit. hermit. Yeah. There's it also... must have been that. It was a very, it's a very cold little spot though, that grotto. I don't know how it whether there was a fireplace or a fire or something within it. I believe it there is, was. It's very nippy at the moment, because again, there's no natural there's no electricity, no natural um, no, no sort of fire sources and stuff. I remember somebody doing a poetry reading in their uh, oh, right. competition years and years and years ago. And you had to take up gas lights and lamps and stuff, and it was bitterly cold. You know, breath was frosting out, so it must have been, you know, there must have been some form of heating if there was a, a poor, straggy little hermit living in there. Yeah, we don't know if he was, but uh, that is two yeah. of the legends that people say. Now, also, Molly had her eye on the folly. Oh, the folly. Which is, uh, which is there as well. I mean, this, yeah. I quite like the, fo now they believed, or they believed they were building on the site of a Roman watchtower. But... Oh, right, I say, wonder, yeah not entirely sure whether the evidence yeah. bears it out but that was the idea now original folly may well have been built in again john hanbury's time but originally it wouldn't have had any kind of levels at all there weren't floors in it originally it's only in the oh. 1830s when molly mackworth got involved uh, that the floors were put in uh, you see it's the idea is it's almost of a steam if you can build something 1000 feet above sea level Oh, yes. So they build this, uh, but they fall actually about 20 feet short, annoyingly. Oh, right. <laughs> right. right. It's, it's a bit of a shame. Yeah, um, it's a, it is a, a, a major landmark, you can see it everywhere. Unfortunately, that was a problem in the Second World War. Oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, I know, yes, that's right, I know, I know this bit, because it was, it was, it was taken down, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and put back up after the war. Not because as, it was such an obvious feature. Not as simple as that. No, but you're quite right. It was destroyed. It was destroyed in 1940 and not put back up until quite very recently. Yes, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So they got rid of it because obviously it would be a navigational point for the Luftwaffe. Oh, yeah. It makes sense. Uh, but it took a lot of, um, an awful lot of fundraising, uh, £60,000. And I like this, 175 tonnes of dressed stone from a recently demolished primary school was donated in the 90s. Oh, right. Oh, gosh. And uh, all kinds of people got involved. And eventually yeah. uh, it was opened by Prince Charles in, or reopened by Prince Charles yeah. in 1994. Oh, right. Sort of rebuilt oh, rather than restored. Yeah, I didn't realise it was as recent 
as, as a recent as that, well, I say recent, it's still 25 years ago, but I didn't realize it was as recent as that. I thought it was a, a being put up clo closer to, uh, to the wall. Well, well, well. No, but you can get there, of course, if you, uh, you are actually going through farmer's lands. So you've got this sort of trail yeah. which leads up, and uh, it's a great view from the folly, isn't oh, it? It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, look at that. You know, Pontypool Park is a wonderful asset. I mean, it's 158 acres, you know, for the people of Pontypool. And with so much history, I mean, a lot can be done with it. I mean, it's not just the rugby ground and the bandstand and the ski, yeah. you know, the skiing. Oh, know. yeah. yeah uh, There's a lot oh, more yeah, to yeah, yeah. I've skied down that when I was a young man. Oh, well. I went skiing to, uh, yeah, I went, I went skiing to Austria and won a bronze medal with a school. And then when we came back, we went down the dry ski slope. You could have been our Eddie the Eagle of that era. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good enough to get down Ponty Pool, excuse me. <laughs> now, unfortunately, Molly Mackworth did a lot, but I'm afraid they didn't have any children, sadly. So oh. when she died uh, in 1846, Capel uh, remarried. Um, and uh, uh, what was her name? Emma Rouse, I believe. Emma Rouse. Yeah, Rouse. That's another yeah. name that pops up in some of our podcasts, uh, and he does have children, um, although it's very late for his son. Uh, daughters appeared, and he had his son at the ripe old age, his son and heir, at the ripe old age of 78. Thank goodness, oh, I didn't realise that. Thank Crikey. goodness for nannies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that old line about Charlie Chaplin, isn't it? Oh, he had a, he had a child in his late 70s. Yes, but he was too old to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at him. There he is, Capel Hanbury Lee. Yeah. Uh, useful chap. Um, donated. Now, now, by this time, they've got rid of the ironworks from Pontypool Park. And they're not really in the ironworks game as much now. So he's right. become a sort of a, a, he's the Lord Lieutenant of Monmouthshire. Right. And it's that sort of local grandee. Uh, but a very likable man and a very, very generous one. But mm. like I said, he was 78 when he had his first son. Uh, so he lasted a long time. He was 85 when he added and doubled Pontypool Park House in size. Gosh. A lot of what you do today is from Capel Hanbury Lee. Yeah. He's called Lee because, again, there was a, a relative, um, Lord Lee, who said, my nearest of kin, through the Tracy family, my, the nearest yeah. of kin, um, I will give £20,000 if they change their name to Lee. And as the Hanburys oh, always yeah. do, give us some cash. Call us what you like. It's like, like yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were they managed to make a lot of money just of being very well married. They were very well connected. <laughs> it's, it's almost as if the family was sponsored. You know, oh, like yeah, a football right, yeah. team shirt. You need this... to carry on a family name. <laughs> Get the Hanburys. Yeah, this generation will be are sponsored by the Lee family. Yeah. <laughs> this generation <laughs> sponsored by the Williams of Killian. <laughs> But anyway, Goff, now this is an important point because when he's doing one of his last uh, sort of renovations of Pontypool Park House was in 1861. So when this is all going on, he moves to his marine residence in Panath. And this is where you, I think, oh, yes. take up the story. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, as the building works were being done on Pontypool Park House, they moved the family decamped to Plymouth House in Panath, take the, take the waters. But while there... Um, Capel Hanbury Lee had a, had a fall and he, he was getting yeah, on, he was 85, he fell. So he was, while he was recuperating from, from the fall, the various doctors came in, gave him sort of, you know, medicines and this happened and, and, uh, and had to be looked after. So he recovered and the, the fall was okay. He wasn't, he had a slip, a slip on the stairs. So he didn't do any serious damage. He did, but obviously a, a, by implication reading of it, there was a lot of bruising and various things. So he was laid up in bed and being looked after. But he was recovered sufficiently and they were actually making preparations to come home from, from Plymouth House. Um, and then it all went ever so slightly wrong oh in dear. the worst possible way that you could imagine. Um, basically because of this. Embrocation. Oh, there it is. There it is. This is an Elbridge's embrocation, is that what he's doing? But he became victim of patent medicines at the end of it. So his uh, in the morning on a Friday, his uh, valet, 
uh, Riddlesdale, William Riddlesdale comes in. They've been valley for about 28 years, so they've been together for a very, very long time. Yeah. Very well liked. And uh, Capel hand really he says, Could you be, be, pour, get me my medicine off the counter? So Riddlesdale looks at the shelf, three bottles on the shelf, one empty, two, two thirds full. Um, and he pours him in a little measuring glass. I'm so annoyed because I had one of these Victorian measuring glasses and, mm-hmm. I, and it's gone over the decades. I don't know where it went. All marked, they were little, basically little beakers marked in tablespoons. So he pours in three tablespoons of the medicine, gives it to Hanbury Lee. Hanbury Lee takes a swig, immediately spits out two tablespoons worth, saying, I think you've given me the wrong medicine. So, <laughs> so Ritterdale goes back to the shelf and rather ominously saying, at this point, I put on my glasses. Which was, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh no. God. And because Riddersdale, had, the, the valet, hadn't been responsible for giving me his medicine. Either M- Mrs. Lee had done it, um, uh, Mrs. Hanbury Lee had done it, or a, a woman who was a sort of nurse, whatever that means, a sort of nurse. Right. So he, he puts his glasses on, reads the bottle, and discovers it is, in fact, Hawkins' embrocation, external use only. Ooh. And these are these patent a patent medicine. I, I've been trying, I was trying to find if there was something existing for Hawkins embrocation, but not. But I've actually managed to find this. This is the advertisement there. Elements universal embrocation. These were patent medicines. Now, at the time, medicine replication and pharmacy seemed to be very, very, very sparsely regulated, if at all. This game predates any form of sort of National Health Service or NICE or all these sort of things. And crack medicines, they said they were cheap poisons for the poor. Palatable poisons for the poor was mm. one of it. But even um, th- these were advertised in the back of local papers. Um, and so people, even, even you know, the well-off, the rich would get, you know, a bottle of this if it was considered to be good. There was generally always a branding for someone. This is a little bit, this is a lady on bicycling. And you see yeah. embrocation for stiffness, aches, sprains and bruises. Mm. Uh, and it's like a wonderful thing. It's... It I will have, or I will have none. And I love the wonderful calm look on her face as the gentleman runs upside down. She's not really fussed about it, is it? Just like, <laughs> yeah. But evidently, so this is what was being applied, should have been applied to Hanbury um, externally um, from his embrocation bottle. But sadly, he ended up taking a large swig of this. So Riddlesdale, um, Riddlesdale said, shall I get a doctor? Uh, no, shall I call Mrs. Hanbury back and... and, and Cape and said, no, no, don't leave it. And then he said, well, shall I, shall I get a doctor? Shall I get the doctor or Mr. Payne, who was the medical practitioner? So at this point, Henry's had enough and just told you to be quiet. But said, shall I get a doctor? Oh, shut up. So they, <laughs> so they pre-prop him up in bed and whatever. And it turns out that the footman comes into the room and says that there's a Dr. Essex on his way. who was a surgeon who had been basically looking after him uh, during this process. Let me just turn, uh, try and get this off the screen for us for the moment. Um, um, maybe I'm meeting control. So the surgeon, uh, Dr. Essick, comes in and they realise that this bloody embrocation is lethal, basically. These things were dead, terribly, terribly poisonous. And the medical profession obviously did realise that the, the, these patent medicines were so bloody dangerous. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, they call up another doctor, a Dr. Payne, and they, but they do all the usual processes. And of course, the papers go into, at the inquest, the papers go into these dreadful details of what was done to try and the limit the effect of the poison on on, on Hanbury. Um, but sadly, he par- he dies. Um, the, the, the embrocation destroyed the stomach lining and affected them and, and and he died on, yeah, he took it on Friday morning and he died 2.30 on Saturday. Um, oh there's a window, so, yeah, again, it was, so again, as the usual is, they're in Penarth, so they go straight to the St. Fagans Castle Hotel <laughs> in, for, the, for the inquest. <laughs> and so you, you, you were saying you could possibly, if you read these uh, follow-up podcasts, you could go on a tour of famous inquest sites <laughs> around the world. The, the St. Fagans Castle Hotel in Penarth still stands there, and they hold the inquest there, and they get the various you know statements from the doctors and from Riddlesdale and what have you. Mm. Um, and there's a very sort of sad, uh, sad comment, shall we say, from uh, at the end of it all. Um, let me just see if I can find the little quote. Uh, basically, the inquest said it was, it was simply, it was clearly an accident. It was, uh, mm. it, it hadn't been done. The uh, Riddlesdale was not at all, it was, was culpable, but after, but not culpable in any way. And he says that the greatest sympathy is felt for the unfortunate man whose sad but innocent inadvertency occasioned this terrible calamity. 
he has, we understand, been ever since in a state bordering upon distraction. Oh, so, oh well, I bet. Was, oh, was valid. Was really was, yeah, it was really a Paul. No, it was really, you know, gutted because they were very close. And mm. that was the Western Daily Press. Um, mm. Mm. But the other reports that we have is actually comes from the dreaded Monbyshire Merling, or as I like to think of it, that oleaginous rag. Um, and it says, um, oh dear, 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 the, the deplorable mishap which closed the Lord Lieutenant's life loses none of its poignancy from the circumstance that his extreme age rendered it impossible that he could, in the natural course of events, have survived much longer. Oh, oh that's all right then. Ooh. So basically, you know, he was 85, he probably wasn't going to live much longer, but, but you know, the fact that he was poisoned didn't really, <laughs> not in the future. That's but a little cold, is isn't it? A bit cold-blooded. Very cold blooded, as well as sort of fawning all over them. They're that cold blooded. But there's a very interesting little sub story which mm. which comes out in the inquest, but isn't really picked up upon. Mm. The whole reason this mishap happened with with the embrocation was for some reason Mrs. Lee, Henry Lee's Mrs. Henry Lee, had said to to Cable Henry, "You've got to stop taking this medicine now." That's enough. They don't take any more of that medicine mm. because the doctors were only treating him by essentially what we would have thought of painkilling medicine. Right. So they were, they maybe been an opioid, maybe something like that, but it was a painkiller. So same as like today, if you have a thought, oh, we'll take, you know, take paracetamol and what I, 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 whatever, but they, they, was, they say they, were gave, they had given him no external um, treatment at all. Mm. So they were perfectly just basically giving him what would have been painkillers. Now, for some reason, his wife said, you've got to stop taking those painkillers. Uh, and got, they, they must have got the patent medicine themselves, the implication themselves. So in order to, she must have known he was going to do something, he was going to take the medicine. So in order to stop him taking the medicine, she took the bottle. <sighs> so the only bottles that were left on the shelf mm. were the embrocation bottles. And of course, Riddlesdale didn't know because he'd never given him his medicine before. Or had his glasses on. Or, or had his glasses <laughs> on. He didn't have his glasses on and he didn't know that they weren't the medicine bottles. Well, yeah, and of course, how... And old Kate, and had Cable Hanbury, but she, she, his wife was perfectly right. As soon as she went out of the house, he was going to take his medicine, despite the fact she told him not to. Well, it's a terrible thing. Uh, he went sad. out. It's a, a simple accident. Yeah. He went out with a massive funeral. I mean, uh, oh, unbelievable. Enormous. Estimates yeah. of fifteen to eighteen thousand people. There were twenty-seven yeah. mourning coaches, uh, and quite frankly, the list of people there are a who's who of our podcast. I'm sure they didn't do that deliberately, but no, there was the Reverend Sir Charles Salisbury of Flanwern House. Mm. There was the Reverend Thomas Prothero of Malpas Court. There was Alexander Rolls of the Hendra family, and the pallbearers were Lord Tredega, Lord Flanova, Colonel Tint. Kevin oh, Mabley, yeah. Yeah. John Arthur Herbert of Flanarth Court, Octavius Morgan of the Friars, the Reverend Augustus Morgan of Macken, Godfrey Morgan and Frederick Morgan of Tredega and Ribera yeah. Castle were both there, and there was clear representation as well. So <laughs> basically, everybody that we've talked about went Turned up. to Hanbury's funeral. Good Turned Lord, up. isn't that incredible? <laughs> but, as, but as for what happened, because he had this boy, of course, if you remember. He had yes. this, uh, this child who must only been about seven, seven or was, eight. Exactly so. Who was seven or eight. Um, mm. And he eventually then did become uh, heir. Sorry for the side. This is the best photo I could find. There he is. Uh, he's the last one to oh. live at Pontypool Park House. Oh, right. He was the last one. And guess what his name was? We'll call him John. And you know why we'll call him John? Because his right. name was John Capel Hanbury. John Capel Hanbury. They right? loved their, their Capels. Yeah. He was the man who knew Edward the Seventh. They were into racehorsing and, and shooting and, and things like that. Oh. Now, he gave the land for Pontypool Hospital, Pontypool Library, and the West Mon Grammar School. But you get the sense of things going away at this time, of things yeah. winding up. And indeed, in 1908, he left Pontypool for his health. He went to Scotland. Uh, by 1912, the house itself was leased to a Roman Catholic order of nuns, the Sisters of the Holy Ghost. Oh. And for oh, a while, there it is. It was a mini, it was a convent for a while. Yeah. In 1920, oh, the, the 158 acres of land of Pontypool Park was uh, given, was sent to the council's control for £11,000. Hmm. And uh, in fact, Pontypool Park House 
then became a Roman Catholic high school, which is what it is today. Yes. St Albans. Yes, I thought it was still there. Yep, still there. (laughs) Unfortunately, there was a a fire in the 1990s inside, so I'm not sure how much uh, original sort of interior work remains. Probably very, very little, but you've still got the, the basic shell. Yeah. A lot of the work, I think, done by Capel Hanbury Lee in the 19th century. But this bit here shows some of the old John Hanbury house, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. You, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, the, yeah, you can see the, the, the front porch area. The porch area looks very similar. Uh, John Capel Hanbury, uh, he died in 1921 and he didn't have a son. He had a daughter, Ruth. In fact, Ruth was the little girl. If I can go back. Don, 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 there's Ruth. Oh, I, don't, right, yes. I don't know the name of the dog, unfortunately. <laughs> is Ruth Hanbury? Sadly, on that, Busby. I am You've sad. I am sadly. I'm very disappointed with it. I know, uh, but she married a she married a General Gerard uh, or Gerald Tennyson, and uh, their son was a man that we've talked about, Sir Richard Hanbury Tennyson, who lived and the family still live at Clither Park. Oh, so the line you could say now goes through the Clither Park branch yeah. of this particular. Hanbury uh, family. Mm. Um, so as we said, it's St Albans uh, School and we've talked about what's in the grounds. Now, one thing that is interesting, very close to the house is this. And this is the ice house. Oh, I don't know why it's so close to the house. Uh, Llanwern House had a, and has an ice house, though it's mostly filled in now. Mm. Um, but it's not just that it's here. It's very curious because it's a two-chambered ice house, which I've never heard of before. No. See the plans. You got it's a two-chamber ice house. I'm not sure why they needed such an innovative ice house so close to the house itself. Not entirely. Do you think it's it's a, a repurposed uh, building hanging over from an early industrial use that was then turned into an ice and house? Then turned into a, repurposed into an ice house. I've got no idea, but it is odd, isn't it? It does look odd, isn't it? Those chambers look peculiar, don't they? Yeah. Maybe we'll have an expert in ice houses who can let us know in the comments. Mm. Uh, yeah, why or would... bit, or, yeah, or maybe those are about early industrial processes and see what was there. Well, possibly, <laughs> yeah. Mm. And uh, this, uh, this is the stable block before renovation. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I recognise that, uh, that entrance way. Of course, the stable block today is Torvine Museum. That's right, yeah, Torvine Heritage Museum. The ice house is up here. It's very close to the actual house itself. Yeah. Um, So it lives on. I mean, they've got that wonderful facility, uh, Pontypool Park. um, And uh, you could say the Hanburys, like I said, live on at Clither. Yeah, right. Yeah, yes, yeah. The fact is, yeah, the family is still, third, are still persisting. <laughs> I think they are, yeah. So it's they were a colourful they, they? they just need to marry into somebody else and get another major donation and it'll be fine. That's how it works for them. <laughs> yeah, they can change. Yeah, they need to marry in to get back. I think then they can yeah. change their name to something like Abramovich. Yeah, yes, yes. Abramovich. Hanbury Abramovich. I mean, <laughs> Sir Charles was ambassador in St. Petersburg. It does fit very nicely, of course. Um, so, so it could work out well, I think. Sits together well, isn't it? Yeah. So that well, was Pontypool Park. It was a nice that's little really Very interesting. I didn't realise how... Yeah, particularly the 1700s part of it, I didn't realise. The 18th century characters were really fascinating. I knew a little bit more about the 19th century ones. But mm, mm. yeah, no, no, well, well, well. Yeah, and I still think I we need to pu- try and look up look up some of his licentious poetry later. It's easy to find. <laughs> it's easy to find. Yeah, it's all over the place. Charles Hanbury Williams's poetry. Oh gosh. Um, he was close to well, in his circle was Francis Dashwood, but there's no oh, yeah. there's no evidence that Hanbury Williams was involved with the Hellfire Caves or anything like that. Is. But it's the sort of Hellfire. thing he might have done to while away an evening. Yeah, I'm looking at this sort of, you know, his, the way he behaves when he was in London. It does definitely, he would sit very well with the Hellfire Friars, wouldn't he? But not he at Cold Brook, happy. where he was awfully well behaved in Monmouth. Yeah, yes, he's very, yeah. So I blame that life. London. <laughs> <laughs> that London's to blame. That London's a problem, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so thank you all for watching. Um, yes. Do like, share, and subscribe, and we will be back fairly soon, I think, with our next one. So, really? thank you very much.
，拜拜。